we are going to discuss about King Lear. King Lear is a Shakespearean study of Aristotelian formula of perfect tragedy. And uh, if you see the modern nuances of the play, we see that King Lear is one of the prime example of gerontological decay. What do you mean by gerontological decay? Gerontological decay has always been a field of study in the modern times when daughters or sons don't take care of their father because they are old. Old age homes have flourished over the last few decades like mushrooms, wild mushrooms. Why? Because the parents were unruly, they were uncontrollable, and Shakespeare is looking at this particular problem when there was no old age homes. And therefore, King Lear is basically subjected to unaccommodation, as Lear himself says, an unaccommodation, uh, an, an, an unaccommodated man is no man at all. So age in chronological time frame has provided a unique space in Shakespearean characters. Lear's world is gradually decentered by his aged logos and therefore secluding him in the trauma and thereby increasing his anxiety. Now, anxiety structure of King Lear starts because of his old age. Gerontologically, 60 was regarded as a milestone for the old age, the age where dementia takes over, the age where uh, other problems takes over like infirmity, lack of cognition, cognitive disappearance, paralysis and many other psychological syndromes. Lear himself said that he is three score and he wants to die unburdened, quote unquote, unburdened. Now, Lear's problem begins when he wants an advertisement of love. He wants that his uh, lack of phallus symbolized by the age will be supplemented by the real phallus. Now when you say phallus we go into more Lacanian term. Phallus was the crown of King Lear. Right? Symbolical, uh, in the symbolical realm, it is the Lear's crown. Now, Laka says, or talks about this in his seminar 10, he talks about a Borobian knot. Imaginary, symbolic, real. Imaginary when it exists in a perfect order, symbolic when it comes out through language, and real when there is no representation. So, Lear's crown was a symbolic phallus. With age, he loses his phallus. And thereby, he needed a real phallus. And, his castration complex becomes acute when he wants his daughter to use love as a supplementary power to his kingship and love as a commodity that can be used as the phallus. Both Regan and Goneril agrees with such phallocentric structure in the symbolic space but in the real space it has no representation and therefore comes Cordelia's word nothing. 
In the culture of politics, phallus represents power and authority. Prospero, in Tempest, found it after his banishment in his wand. Lear finds it when he loses his crown in his condition of nothingness. A man who had everything has become nothing. A man who is simply a source of power has ceased to become the source of power. Lear's power differs and differs with age. To use Derrida's formulation of difference, differing is in the temporal plane and differing it is in the spatial plane. So differs and differs. When he was young, he had absolute authority. He is an absolute monarch. With age, his power differs, and therefore differs. That is, in spatio-temporal space, in spatio-temporal realm, he, his power is not only different than his young age, but is also in a deferred way. His desire for the advertisement of love commodification of love is basically a materialistic amalgamation of the emotional quotient. Ontology will be replaced by phylogy, the physicality. And thereby King Lear, when he enters the storm scene, he is a castrated man, an unaccommodated man, even worse than animal. And the storm scene, A.C. Bradley says, is both microcosmic and macrocosmic in his Shakespearean study of Shakespearean tragedy. G. Wilson Knight brilliantly portrays it as one of the most cosmic tragedy, the storm scene. But what I see the, uh, the storm scene as it's a kind of uh, a movement that happened in life that takes away the youth and plunges you into the spasm of old age. Shakespeare always associated the cosmic events with human. As we see, Macbeth begins with thunder and lightning, enter three witches. We see the tempest raging when Macbeth murders Duncan. We see Tempest raging when uh, Julius Caesar is murdered. And we see Tempest raging when Lear loses his kingship. So uh, the macrocosm and the microcosm becomes intertwined. And the man who has everything at the beginning has now nothing. The word of Cordelia becomes true when he says, Thou, my last but not least, tell me, you know, how much you love me. And he says, she says, Olivia says nothing. And therefore nothing becomes a reverberative truth that reverberates through the various levels of Lingria. There are about 28 times the word nothing has been used in the entire play. And thereby moving it to the level of absurdity, reminding us definitely of that of, uh, uh, reminding definitely that of uh, uh, um, absurd plays, uh, of um, uh, waiting for Godot, for instance, where the two tramps uh, basically goes on, Vladimir and Gogo uh, basically goes on uh, to portray the absurdity of human alienated situation and Lear is nothing but an alienated being and at the end when he loses his power of language he remains an alienated being. Thank you.